Greetings, all of you. My dear sisters and brothers, and my dear friends, a warm welcome to all of you from your pastor, Yeti. We are on Thursday, and we're moving on in our actions. But as I said in the beginning of the week, we have to read some chapters to get it all together in this week. So we are now in chapter 11 of in the book of Genesis. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Tower of Babel. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. So this is the story of the Tower of Babel where God started to begin to change the language that they didn't understand each other anymore. So the confusion of their language. And then we are in chapter 12, Abraham's family. And this is also an account of the Terah's family line. And <clears throat> we don't have to read that too. So Genesis 12 says the call of Abraham. The Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the this, this, this site of the grave tree of Moreh at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east, and there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. And Abram set out and continued toward Negev, Abram in Egypt. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while, because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abraham well for her sake, and Abraham acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abraham's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abraham. What have you done to me? He said. Why did you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister, so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. 
Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his man, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. Genesis 13 Abram and Lot separated. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. From the Negev he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, and Bethel means house. To the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier, and where he had first built an altar. There Abraham called on the Lord, the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abraham, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's um, herders and lots. The Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land all that time. So Abram said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me, or between your herders and mine. For we are close relatives. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked around and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan toward Zoar was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of Plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, Look around from where you are, to the north and south, to the east and west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offsprings forever. I will make your offsprings like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So Abram went to the land near, uh, went to uh, life near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he pitched his tents. There he built an altar to the Lord. And then the last chapter for this week is Abraham rescues Lot. At a time when Amraphel was king of Shinar, Arioch king of Elazar, Kedor Leomer king of Elam, and Tidal king of Goyim. These kings went to war, went to war against Bera king of Sodom, Birsha king of Gomorrah, Shinab king of Admach, Shemeber king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. All these latter kings joined forces in the valley of Sidim, that is, the Dead Sea Valley. For twelve years they had been subject to Kedor Leomer, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Kedor Laomer and the kings Eliot with him went out and defeated the Rephaites in Hashterot Karnaim, the Susites in Ham the Imitats in Shevach Kiriatiam, and the Horitites in the hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran near the desert. Then they turned back and went to En Mishpach, that is Kadesh, and they conquered the whole territory of the Amalekites 
as well as the Amorites who were living in Hazazon, Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomar, uh, Gomorrah, the king of Admach, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, marched out and drew up their battle lines in the valley of Sidim against Kedor Laomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elazar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidim was full of tar pits, and when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some of the men fell into them, and the rest fell flat to the hills. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their food. Then they went away. They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions, since he was living in Sodom. A man who has escaped came and reported this to Abram, the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eschol and Aner, all of whom were alien with Abram. When Abram heard that this relative had been taken captive, he called out the trained man born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Turning the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them pursuing them as far as Hobab, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions together with the woman and the other people. After Abram returned from defeating Kedor Laomer and the king's Eliot with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shavech, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem brought out wine, bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise to be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for you. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, With raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord, God Most High, Creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a treat or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the man who went with me, to Aner, Eskol, and Mamre. Let them have their share. Till this 14 chapter. Amazing. What came very strong to me is that Abram is building an altar to worship his God. And he remembered very well that God said to him not to take anything from the enemy because it would take off his blessing. And he said that to this king, you heard it. It's very important not to accept gifts because sometimes you never know where it comes from. And I'm not talking about birthday presents or just a gift from a dear friend or a relative or whatever it's about when it comes to in the spiritual life about the enemy so let's talk about our action in the greatest stories of our devotional study Most married couples either videotape their wedding ceremony or do a DVD or hire a photographer to chronicle the happy days events. Some do both. Why? 
Well, most couples find themselves caught up in the whirl of emotions and thoughts, and find that they have a difficult time remembering the details of the day. Things move so fast that the whole day seems like a blur. Having a video or a DVD or a photo album allows them to go back and reconstruct the events. It helps them remember. They may not go back and review things every day, but on special occasions it's nice to be able to recall what it was like to be so young. And idealistic and in love, wonderful. Love fades sometimes. Well, the emotional part of it. Marriage is not for the faint-hearted. We wear rings as symbols and have pictures to remind us of the commitment we made in front of God and everyone else. We celebrate our universe anniversary. Sorry, anniversaries annual. Annually, because we must remember our vows to love and honor and cherish until deaths do us part. It's been said that no woman ever forgets that she's married, but a husband or a wife can sometimes fail to act like he or she is married. And I'm talking also about. Relationships, married couples, man, man, women, women. So, so we are here to say that some husbands or a wife can sometimes fail to act like he or she is married. So, having built-in reminders is a good thing, and it's a similar story for people. And their relationships with God. It was certainly the case for the Israelites in the Old Testament. It was impossible for them to forget that God had delivered them out of Egyptian bondage and into a land flowing with milk and honey, but they often failed to act like that. God desperately wanted His people to remember where they'd come from, and. How he delivered them, so he built in some reminders. Every year, they observed the Passover. Periodically, they offered sacrifices. There were special meals, special meal days of fasting and days of feasting. Much of their lives were oriented around activities designed to prompt their memories. God knew. That if they fail to live with the memory of deliverance fresh in their minds, they would repeat the destructive pattern of an enslaved people again and again, leading them back into more extreme form of bondage. Today, take some time to remember what God has done for you. Specifically, remember the deliverance He has offered you. At no expense to you whatsoever. Remember how he brought you out of your own personal form of slavery, slavery to sin and selfishness and destruction patterns of behavior. Remember how he delivered you from loneliness and alienation, how he brought you into a land of purpose and meaning. And relationships, taking you off the path of certain destruction, and transplanting you into a path headed for an eternal home. Remember how he took your sorrow and gave you joy in return, took your anxiety and gave you peace, took your fear and gave you confidence. Christianity expects certain things of its adherents. Christians are expected to give and serve, love and forgive others, and offer thanks to God on a regular basis. 
It could be that those things will flow more easily from our hearts if we would regularly take time to simply remember. It's very important, my dear brothers and sisters and my dear friends, to remember. I'm not saying to go back and live in the past. No, to remember. To remember what is given to you from God. Why we took that example of a DVD or a videotape. And here we talked about the marriage, but it can also be from our children. To have a reminder when they were babies till now. For some, maybe are already young adults having children by their own. So the main thing is remember what God did in your life. And remember that once in a while. Like Abram went from place to another place. He was building an altar. We don't have to go to the instructions of the Old Testament anymore. Because Jesus Christ was the sacrifice for our restoring our life. But let us build a milestone of remembrance what he did for us. May God bless you in your morning, in your noon time, and in your evening. And when you lay your head on your pillow and think about everything what happened in your day, giving back the glory and the honor and the worship to your God. Let him bless you and bless all the ones who are close to you. Blessings to all of you, my dear ones. This is your Pastor Yeti. Bye.